Hello. Have you seen hi to everybody? There he is. So King's hello to you guys. <laughs> Hey guys, I recently bought three egg cases of the praying mantis that I would raise to, you know, put them in the garden and have them be like something that's beneficial to the garden, which many of us think of them to be. However, there's definitely pros and cons to everything. And of course, that also includes the praying mantis. So I thought I would talk to you guys about this today and then share my experience with you in how I raised them to set them free in the garden. Baby praying mantas are called nymphs and they actually would hatch out of these egg cases. Now, when the female lays the egg, generally that happens in about late summer or fall, and then the winter is too cold, so they're just kind of like in the sack being, like the eggs are being protected in the sack. Uh, you know, whenever it gets warm enough, the condition is favorable, uh, the eggs will start hatching. Then these baby praying mantas, which are called nymphs, would crawl or climb out of the, the egg cases. Now there's about a few up to even 150 per egg case usually that would hatch, but only one to five on average would make it in the wild. The lifespan of these praying mantas is about any time between a few days or maybe a few hours up to six months on average if they're out in the wild because the praying mantas, these babies, would actually eat each other out. So um, I guess that's why we see them as um, a good thing in the garden is because they help eat away, you know, those pests. Uh, but they basically are carnivores, still eat anything that they'll catch. They go through about five to ten molting stages and that all depends on, you know, the variety and the condition. And what they shed is that outer skin, which is called the XL skeleton. I was actually raising mine until they shed the very first one. Um, by the way, shedding, they called it like um, when they molt. The older prementas, which are in their more adulthood, you see with the wings, those wings actually start to develop right before they enter adulthood. Even though they develop these wings, but they actually don't really use them for say long flights or something. They usually use it for just for gliding purposes. Males usually have longer, thinner wings with like just a lighter body. So that would allow them to fly a bit further distance, a bit you know longer so that they can go out and catch their food and to find their mates. Whereas the females generally have shorter, thicker wings and heavier bodies. So the females cannot fly as far as the male, but you know, with that being said, the male cannot fly like a bird anyhow or a butterfly. So the female is more to, the purpose is to kind of fly and glide just to get away from predators. In the animal kingdom and I guess in the insect world, generally the male are smaller than the females. During the mating season, this is where it kind of gets a little horrific and graphic. Before they mate, sometimes the female would eat the head of the male first so they can't run away, mate with them, and then eat the rest of their body. So actually when I heard about that, I was like, ooh, you know? <laughs> Most of us always think of praying mantis being something that's very beneficial in the garden, which is true, but you know, thinking that they are carnivores, they would eat up things like spiders, um, moths, uh, caterpillars in their garden, but they'll also eat bumblebees, you know, your pollinators, butterflies, hummingbirds, lizards. So that is something to think about whether, you know, praying mantis is good for the garden or not. And aside from raising praying mantis in the garden, there's other options in the organic garden to kind of maintain a more like a balance in in the garden is by planting you know a variety of plants or even plants that would host beneficial insects like ladybugs like they love the fennel and dill uh, or you can plant trap crops sometimes if you have issues with certain crops you may want to plant a kale or a nasturtium or something next to those sort of plants to attract the bugs to go to that one spot rather than all of your plants so that's a whole other way besides you know introducing another kind of um, insect to your garden so when i bought these it was in late winter the egg cases were in this little paper bag they came with and it was in the house i totally forgot about them for like just a few days like i was going to make a little terrarium for them to 
you know, kind of hang out until they get a little bigger before I set them out in the garden. But I was just pretty busy, just like how we're doing a lot of different things in life. I suddenly forgot to do that. I think I was just like planning on, on making the terrarium like the next day or two, but then it hit 90 degrees outside and we don't, there's no air con in the house. So it got warm enough for them to hatch. So this very warm day, I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, there's those eggs. I wonder if they hatched or not. And I, I looked, I, I opened the bag and there were like hundreds of these nymphs just crawling, trying to get out of that, that paper bag. So of course I was not prepared for hundreds of nymphs climbing out. I kind of got a bit anxious and decided, you know what, the best thing to do for now is to just bring uh, this reptile or this, this little uh, tank where my friend gave me, she used to grow like have her turtle in there or something. So I put them in there and laid a little sheet over it so they can't come out. I, I left a couple of plants inside just to kind of mimic nature a little bit to get them more comfortable. I think I left a little bit of like coconut water and a water or something inside in case they get thirsty. And uh, I've seen some people would feed them, like put a little dab of honey on a stick and kind of put it up to their little mouth and they would lick it or eat it somehow. So I tried to do that, but they didn't seem to care. I also missed that tank and left it outside under the like, full shade for the, and I think for overnight. And I was like, I'll figure out what to do the next day, you know? And then the next day I noticed there were a bunch that died. I don't know if this is natural. I don't know if they were overcrowded at one point, like in the paper bag, but I did remember having a bunch of them walking around you know in in that that tank it was like a a 10 gallon tank anyhow the next day i found that there were a bunch of them that died and i thought maybe this is natural but oh no did i kill them you know uh, so one of my friends told me that you can actually buy flightless fruit flies where they specifically breed these to feed reptiles that you can purchase at like a pet smart or something so I went to do that because I thought it was much easier to do that than trying to catch something to feed them at this point. They're so tiny, like what can they eat, you know? And I read that you can put banana peel or something to uh, just out there to attract the fruit flies and then you can capture them and feed it to the nymphs. Uh, I just thought it was easier to just have a very concentrated amount of fruit flies to feed them on a regular basis because my plan was to uh, keep them until they shed their first like exoskeleton so that they get a little bigger because each time they shed the exoskeleton they would get bigger so that would make them safer you know being out in the garden i started looking around what kind of information is out there i came across this video where these two people were separating the nymphs in separate uh, individual containers and i happen to have a bunch of those sort of containers like little sauce containers or something although mine i don't think they carried sauce so the lid didn't close all the way i don't know if you need to put holes on them if the lid did close all the way just so that you know they can breathe but mine didn't close all the way so uh i didn't need to poke any holes in fact i need to wrap it in a rubber band so it wouldn't fall off uh so yeah they were fine in there for like two weeks or so I kept them anyway back to the fruit fly story I went to PetSmart and I, it was at that section with the reptiles when they where they sell crickets and I asked them for the fruitless uh, flightless fruit flies and they came in this little tube and I think it was like seven or eight dollars for 50 fruit flies or something it was a pretty warm day I purchased it put it in my purse walked and did some errands and when I went home the, the tube came with a bit of like food that would keep them alive and for the larva to keep hatching and, and you get more fruit flies. You're supposed to get like a few cycles of fruit flies in that one tube. But what happened is that food, that liquidy stuff in an air conditioned room, it was solid. But when I was walking around outside in like 90 degree weather in my purse, the, the tube was um, laying down. So at that point, it actually ended up that food, that liquid food was, was softened, it melted, and it drowned all the fruit flies. <laughs> I came home with, I think, not all, I think I came home with like two fruit flies and the rest were dead. 
So in that meantime, I didn't want to go back and spend on another tube and I thought maybe more would hatch. So I think across that one week of time, every single day, I was catching little fruit flies or gnats in um, the little growing area. And uh, if I caught a little fly here and there, I would use a container and cup it or a tiny little spider. I would put it in and feed each of them every single day. and. Uh, I, you know, it was hard each time to see them eat them because praying mantis actually would, they wouldn't first kill off, you know, their predators before they eat. So they'll just eat them alive. So that was a bit hard to watch. It was pretty crazy to see how a nymph that size can take down something that's double its size, like a, those really skinny, um, long leg mosquitoes they can take those down as well so i fed them with that uh, as well as tiny little uh, like house flies they would eat anything that they can grab so that's something you need to think of before you introduce them in your garden you know yes they eat beetles and and caterpillars or or cabbage butterflies but they also eat the bees the butterflies the hummingbirds reptiles if i knew this information before i purchase it i i'm not sure i might not buy them you know but since i already got them and it seems that most gardeners still says after you know many years like people garden and say that they like keeping praying mantis in their garden so they think there's something there you know so i already have them might as well give them a try so what do you guys think you guys can they actually be a pest in their garden or beneficial leave your comment below right now i will continue on and show you the process of how i raise these praying mantis Hey you guys, it's been about 9 to 15 days since I've had these. That is around the time they would have their first shedding, which is called malting. Originally, I was able to save 20 of them out of the three cases, but one of them didn't make it and I was left with 19. One of them right now is the last one that has not shed or malted, malt yet so i'm just going to keep that one close at sight in my room just to feed him until he kind of i just want them to plump up a little bit so they have a better chance of surviving out in the wild it is about oh no i just dropped one it is about uh, mid 80s right now so they do like the weather warm that's why it's good to set them out in the daytime when it's still I guess the temperature is very comfortable for us, would be comfortable for them, and uh, probably would mist out this area a little bit with water in case they want some humidity or they want some water to drink. They're all in their individual containers, and I find that it's best to keep the container really clear so that when you put food in, they can see and catch it right away. Let's release them one by one. I'm gonna let them hang out on this tree. Okay, all of you. Hey you. Oh, <laughs> he's right here. He's right here. Ah. <laughs> Where? Focus, please focus. Huh? Oh, there you go. Oh my gosh, they're both together. <laughs> Last week I freed all the babies except for one because he is the smallest of the bunch and he didn't molt yet. I just thought it would be safer to at least have him go through his first 
molting so that he gets a little bigger and safer to be in the wild. So I fed him a little more, you know, now that I've only been, uh, I only needed to baby one of them. So just within actually a few days apart, he was already shedding his second skeletal. I forget what it's called. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, he's gotten so much bigger now. I'm now wondering the rest of his family if they have shed their second skeletal yet. <laughs> Are you? Good luck, little buddy. Good luck, little one. Surprise you guys, I was watering the plants and then you guys see what I'm seeing. Look at this baby praying mantis just hatched. There's more that hatched from that egg that was here like five weeks ago. I thought we were done. I'm so glad I didn't compost it because there's more that hatched. You guys see him or her? I can't tell. Oh, he's climbing. Hey, buddy. I freed this guy, this praying mantis, I think over about two to three weeks now, and he's gotten bigger. Do you remember me? Nope. All right, guys, that is it. So good luck to all of them. Thank you, you guys, for joining me out here to free them in the garden. I hope they will enjoy this place. And please don't reduce the population of my beneficial insects. <laughs> if you guys enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel and hit the bell notification button for updates. For plants, seeds, and garden supplies, please go check out my website. I will put that link down below. Thank you for watching. I shall see you right back here in the next video. Happy gardening.